What's going on guys, Justin here, and welcome back to our ninth example video following our course on abstract algebra. Now, today's examples are gonna be all on cosets, so with my introduction out of the way, let's go ahead and get into this first example here. So for this first example, we want to find all left and right cosets of the set generated by S and R2, which is a subgroup of D6. So let's start by finding out exactly what is generated by S and R2. Great. So starting off with the simple things, well, we will of course have the identity, and then we will have S and R2 themselves, but if we apply S twice, we will go back to the identity. If we apply R to R squared, we will get R to the fourth, and then if we apply R squared once again, we will get back to the identity once again. So now we need to combine S and R2, and we can do that in the following way. We will have S and R2, then we will have S and R to the fourth. And that will be all of the elements generated by S and R squared in D6. So let's go ahead and call this group H and then we can go ahead and continue. So first I wanna know that H will be a coset of this set here as we can just have it be multiplied kind of trivially by the identity element there. Uh, so of course the identity times H is the same thing as H times the identity, which is just equal to H. So that will be our first coset there. Great. So now let's kind of come up, now let's try and come up with a second coset and I will go ahead and do that now. That will be R times H. So let's see what we get when we apply R to all of our elements of H here. So let's see, if we apply R to the identity, we will get just R. If we apply R to S, we will go ahead and get RS, or let's go ahead and rewrite that as S times R to the fifth. Great. Then we can apply R to R squared and we will get R cubed. Then we can apply R to R to the fourth and we will get R to the fifth power. Then we can apply R to S R squared and applying our commutation relation, that's the same thing as multiplying by R to the fifth on the right, and that will give us SR to the seventh or just SR to the first. Then we can do the same thing on SR to the fourth and we'll get SR to the ninth or just SR to the third. Great. And so there we have six elements, just like our set H, so we have finished that there. And I want to go ahead and note that this is the same thing as the right coset H times R by our commutation relation there. Great. And we can see that if we union our H and our R times H, we will get our entire set D6, which means we have found all of the left and right cosets of our set there. Great. So let's go ahead and get into our next example. So for this problem, we want to show that the right cosets of a subgroup in a group form a partition of the group. Now this is actually really similar to an example we did in the lecture video corresponding to this example video. And the way to prove that they form a partition is to prove two things. So we want to prove that the cosets are disjoint. So I'll go ahead and write that, that the cosets are disjoint. And we also need to prove that the cosets union to the group. So I'll go ahead and write that, that the cosets union to group. Great. And like I said, I'm not going to do both of these because I think they're extremely similar to the examples in the lecture video. I'm just going to do the union one because I think it's more fun. But if you would like to do the disjoint proof, feel free to go ahead and work it out on your own and post about it in the comments for homework. So like I said, I'm going to do the proof that the cosets will union to the entire group. So let's go ahead and get our setup for that proof here. So let's go ahead and start by supposing that we have some subgroup of a group G and we'll call that subgroup H. Great. And so now we want to consider all the union of all of the right cosets of that subgroup H. So we want to consider what I just said. We want to consider the union of all of the right cosets of H as our little x goes through all of the elements of G there. And so from here, I want to note that we have the following containment, and that is that this union that I've just written out for you here of all of the right cosets of H is a subset of G. And that is because we have that HX is a subset of G. So the union of all of the HXs will, all, will of course also be a subset of G. 
Great. And so now we want to take an element little g from our big G here. And so taking that element, we will have that our little g will be in the right coset h times little g. But of course, h times little g is a subset of our union of all of the right cosets of h. So like I said, that is a subset of the union of all of the cosets of h there. But that's actually all we need to do to show our reverse containment. As we took an arbitrary element from g, and we have shown by this statement here that it is in the union of all of our right cosets of H. So like I said, that means that G is a subset of our union there as we union across all right cosets of our H there. But because we have this statement here and this statement here, we have proven our set equality. And that is that if we union all of our right cosets of our subgroup H, we will get the group. Great, and like I said, if you want to do the proof for the fact that they are disjoint, feel free to work that out and post about it in the comments. So let's go ahead and get into our next example. So for this next example, we wanna prove the following our equivalent theorem that we proved in the lecture video, but we're gonna do it in a different order. And so we're gonna be doing that in the order one implies four, four implies two, two implies five, five implies three, and lastly, three implies one for a different ordered loop of equivalences there. Great, so let's go ahead and start out with the first proof, which is that one implies four. So go ahead and write that that is the proof we're doing. And so one implies four. So let's go ahead and suppose our set up here. So we're gonna suppose that we have that x h is equal to y h. And then what we want to show, I'll put in parentheses, we wanna show that that means that y is in x times h. Great, so from here I want to note that y times e is in the set y h as the identity is in h and we have it as a right multiple of y there, but we know that y h is equal to x h, so that means that we have that y times the identity is in x times h. But of course, that means that y is in h as e will do nothing to modify y there. So we will have that y is in xh right away, which completes this first proof. Great, so let's go ahead and do the next proof and that is that four will imply two. Great, so let's start by supposing our four condition there. So we're going to suppose that y is in our left coset x times h. And what we want to do is we want to show that that means that h times x inverse is equal to h times y inverse. Great, so I'll go ahead and write that down. What we want to show, we want to show that our right cosets of the inverses are equivalent there. Great, so let's go ahead and get into it. So the only way to prove that these two sets are equal is by double inclusion. And let's start by doing the forward inclusion first. And Let's use this condition here to start with. So we have that y is in xh. Well, that means that y is equal to x times a little h for some little h, which is in our big h there. And then next, let's take an element g. So let's go ahead and take a little g from our left-hand side of our equality there, h times x inverse, as we are trying to show the forward inclusion first. But just like we did for y there, we can unpack that definition. And that means that g is equal to, let's just call this one h prime times x inverse. And that will be with our h prime in our big H there. Great. And then let's go ahead and apply shoes and socks to our y here to invert it. And that will give us that y inverse is equal to h inverse times x inverse. And then let's go ahead and take it a step further and left multiply by h inverse so that we can solve for our x inverse there to equate our g equality to our y equality. So once we left multiply by h, we'll get h times y inverse is equal to x inverse. But then we can modify our g by left multiplying by h prime inverse as well. And so then we'll also have that h prime inverse times g is equal to x inverse. And then we can set those two equal to each other. 
So setting them equal to each other will give us h times y inverse is equal to h prime inverse times g. And then we will go ahead and left multiply by h prime, and that will give us the following. We will have that g is equal to, well, we have our h prime on the far left there. So we'll have h prime, then we'll have h, and that will be times y inverse. And we can see that here we have two elements of big H being multiplied together and then times Y inverse, which means we have proven that G is in the right coset of H times Y inverse, which completes our forward inclusion there. So now let's go ahead and do our reverse inclusion similarly to the way we did our forward inclusion. And keeping in mind that we are using this condition here, Let's once again go ahead and take an element little g, and this time we'll take it from our h, y inverse. So we'll take g from h, y inverse, and then we'll use the definition there in parallel to our definition for y here. I'll just use the exact same one there so I don't have to write it again. So we'll take g from h, y inverse. Well, that means that g can be written in the following way. We'll have h1, y inverse, is equal to g and once again this will be with our h1 in our big h there and then like i said earlier we will still have our y is equal to x times h and once again that will be for our little h in our big h there great and this time instead of solving for an x inverse, we will be solving for a y inverse. So let's go ahead and negate this y statement here. So when we negate it with shoe socks, we will get y inverse is equal to h inverse times x inverse. And then solving for y inverse with our g statement, we will have the following. By left multiplying by h1, we will get h1 inverse times g is equal to y inverse. And then we can equate these two that I just underlined here in the following way. We will have h inverse times x inverse is equal to h1 inverse times our element g. And then all we have to do is left multiply by h1 here, and we will have finished this one off. We will have that g is equal to h1 times h inverse times x inverse. And just like before, we have an element of h times x inverse, which is of course in the coset h times x inverse there, which means we have completed our reverse inclusion there. And since we have done double inclusion, what we have proven is that h times x inverse is equal to h times y inverse, which is all we needed to prove for four implies two. Great. So let's go ahead and check our next proof. It looks like we need to prove two implies five. And five is that x inverse y is in h. So let's go ahead and get working on that. And so for our setup for this one, we're gonna suppose what we just proved two seconds ago, and we are going to suppose that h times x inverse is equal to h times y inverse. And once again, we want to show the following, and that is that x inverse times y is in big H. Great. So to start this proof off, let's take an arbitrary element g, and we'll take it from our left-hand side of our equation there. Let's take our g in our hx inverse. But because our hx inverse is equal to our y, uh, is equal to our hy inverse, that means, of course, that g is also in hy inverse. And then we will unpack both of these definitions here to proceed with the proof. So that will mean that we can express g in the following two ways. g will be equal to h1 times x inverse, and it will also be equal to h2 times y inverse, and this will be for an h1 and h2, which are both in our subset big H. Great. And then right away, we can equate the right-hand sides of both of these equations. We'll have that h1 times x inverse is equal to h2 times y inverse. And recall that we want to prove that x inverse times y is in h. So what we're gonna do is left multiply by h1 inverse and right multiply by just y. So when we do that, when we multiply by h1 inverse on the left-hand side, we will simply be left with x inverse. 
And when we multiply by y from the right hand side, we will be left with x inverse times y. And that's gonna be equal to, well, let's see, we have h1 inverse here on the left and h2 stays where it is. And you can see that we have x inverse times y is equal to a product of two elements of our co subgroup h, which is of course an element of that subgroup h which means we have completed what we wanted to prove. We showed that X inverse Y is an element of our subgroup big H. Great, so let's go ahead and see what we need to do for our next proof. We need to prove that five implies three, and three is that X times H is a subset of Y times H. So I'll go ahead and write that down. We have that we're doing five implies three this time, and we're gonna suppose what we've just proved. We're gonna suppose that X inverse times Y is an element of big H, and we want to show that this meet, that this implies inclusion, and that is to say that X times H is a subset of Y times H. Great, so just like we've been doing, let's unpack these definitions in parallel, and let's start with what we've supposed at the start. So if X inverse Y is in H, what does that mean? Well, that means that X inverse Y is equal to some arbitrary element of of our subgroup H. So that means we can write it in the following way. We have that X inverse times Y is equal to, let's just call it little h1, and that will be with a little h1 being in our big H there. And then next we are going to take a G from our, from our X times H, but that means that we can write G in the following way, and that is that G is equal to X times an H2, and that will be with H2 in our big H there. Great, and so what we wanna do is combine these two definitions, the one we have for G here, and the one we have for our X inverse Y here to show that our little G is an element of Y times H. So let's start by inverting our G statement here on the left-hand side. So our G, if we invert our G statement with shoe socks, we will get that G inverse is equal to, we'll have H2 inverse times X inverse. Great, and I think now would probably be a good opportunity to solve for our X inverse in our first equation there. So let's go ahead and do that by right multiplying by Y inverse. So that will give us that X inverse is equal to H1 times Y inverse. Great, so now once we solve for X inverse here, we can make a substitution. So let's go ahead and do that. So, so in order to do that, we will need to left multiply by H2. So that will give us H2 times G inverse is equal to X inverse. So now we have the following two equations are equal to each other, so we can write them together. So that will give us that H1 times Y inverse is equal to H2 times G inverse. So let's go ahead and invert both sides of these equations here. So left-hand side will give us Y times H1 inverse, and the right-hand side will give us G times H2 inverse. And now all we have to do is solve for G, and that's very simple. We can just write multiply by H2. And in doing that, we will have that G is equal to Y times H1 inverse times H2. But you can see here we have Y times a product of two elements from H, which of course means that G is an element from the left coset Y times our subgroup big H there. So you can see we started by taking an arbitrary element from our coset XH and we showed that it is in our coset YH, which is all we need to do to show containment there. Great, so now all we have to do is show that three implies one, and that is to say we need to show that the containment of XH in YH is equivalent to saying that XH is equal to YH. So let me erase this and make some more room and then we can get to this final proof. So like I said, our final proof is going to be that three implies one. And so for three implies one, we are going to suppose we have three. So we're gonna suppose that X times H is a subset of Y H. Great, and like I said, I'll go ahead and write in here that what we want to show is that that implies that X H is actually equal to Y H there. 
Great. So let's go ahead and begin with what feels natural and let's go ahead and take an element little g from our coset y times h. Since we're beginning with the assumption that xh is a subset of yh, we only have to show the reverse containment to complete this proof here. So if we can take an arbitrary element from yh and show that it is in xh, we will have completed the proof by double inclusion. Great, so if g is in our yh, that means the following, that means we can express g in the following way where it is a product of y in some arbitrary element, let's call it h1, which is in our big H here. So we have h1 is in our big H, great. And so from here, I want to note the following fact about our containment condition. So I want to note that we, if we have that x is in our left coset y times h, that means we can write x as a product of y in an arbitrary element, let's call it h2, which is in our subgroup big H. So we have x is equal to y times h2 there. And so I'm gonna solve this second equation we just made for h here for y by right multiplying by h2 inverse. So that means that y is equal to x times h2 inverse. I'm gonna go ahead and make this following substitution for y in this equation up here. So that means that g is equal to x times h sub 2 inverse, which is still times h sub 1. And just like we've done for a lot of these proofs here, we have an element of x times two elements from our set big H, which is of course in the left coset h x times big H. So that means we have completed our proof for reverse inclusion here as we took an arbitrary element g from our coset yh and we have shown that it is in our coset xh and since we began with the assumption that xh is contained in yh we have double containment and thus we have shown that our cosets xh and yh are equivalent. Great. So let's go ahead and get into our final example. So for our final example, we want to suppose that the index of G and H is two and that we have the elements A and B are not in our subgroup H. And we want to show that A times B must be in our group H. So right away, I want to note the following. So the by using the definition of index, if we have that the index of G and H is equal to two, that means that our group G can be represented by two cosets, either left or right, but for the sake of this problem, let's go ahead and choose left. So I'll go ahead, so G can be represented by two different left cosets. Great. And one of those cosets is going to be given by just H. So I'll go ahead and write that one of the cosets is given by H. So one of the cosets is just H. Great. But we have the following condition with our A and B and H. So I'll go ahead and write that since our A and our B are both not in H, that means that A and B are in our second coset. So I'll go ahead and say are in the other coset. Next, I want to note the kind of trivial fact that if A is not in our H, that means that our A inverse is not in H. And that's because if A inverse is in H, then A inverse's inverse must be in H, and A inverse inverse will just be A. Great. And so now I want to note the following, and that is that since our a inverse and our B are both not in H. We have the following relationship for the left cosets of A and B, and that is that A inverse times H is not equal to H. And we also have the same thing for B, that B times H is not equal to H. But there are only two cosets of H, and if a inverse H and B and B H are both not equal to H, then they're both equal to the other coset. And if they're both equal to the other coset, that means that they're both equal to each other. So that means that A inverse H is equal to B inverse H. Now let's go ahead and unpack that, what that means. So let's take an arbitrary element from our A inverse H. So I'll go ahead and write that. Let's go ahead and take a G from our A inverse H. Well, because that is equal to BH, that means our G is also in B times H. 
Great, so let's go ahead and apply the definition of what it means to be in the coset. That means that G is equal to a inverse times an H1, which is in our big H, and also that G is equal to B times an H2, which is in our H. So let me go ahead and write that with our H1 and our H2 in our big H there. Great, but now we can set them equal to each other because they are both equal to G. So we'll have that A inverse times H1 is equal to B times H2. But now we can simply left multiply by A inverse, and we will get the following. We will have that H1 is equal to A times B times H2. Great. And so now all we need to do to finish this proof off is to right multiply by H2 inverse. And when we do that, we will have that A times B is equal to H1, and then we have right multiplied by H2 inverse, so we'll have H2 inverse there. And this is obviously an element from H. And all we wanted to show for this problem here is that A times B is in H, and we have completed that proof. So that finishes this last problem off, and that's a good place to stop.